Hello, this is Dr. Dan Guerra from Vera Med, and welcome again to another one of our um, rapturous lectures online. Today, I'm going to talk to you about an unusual rare disease, which is associated with mitochondria. Now, I think most of you know what a mitochondria is. It's a subcellular organelle where the bulk of ATP synthesis occurs. That's an important issue, even that very basic um, concept throughout the entire talk. So when we get into it, I'll continue to refer back to the fact that we're talking about energy deficits. Because in, by and large, it's what we're, that's what the problem is with this very rare and unusual disease. So let's get started. This is my PowerPoint presentation for today. And I'm going to go ahead and click on to get it going. So today we're going to talk about a disease called MELAS, or M-E-L-A-S. MELAS, a mutation in mitochondrial DNA, disease or dissonance. I think you'll see what I mean when I get into this, why we um, might have a problem whether or not to call this a disease or really a dissonance in metabolism, and all the way at the level, actually, of gene expression. So again, I'm Dan Guerra, and I'm Vera Med. There's my uh, email address down there, and let's get started. That first uh, picture was actually from, you guessed it, the Clearwater St. Joe National Forest, where I cut that wood. Here's another picture of it that's exactly above where I shot those rounds of wood that I was cutting up. Remember, I burned it for firewood. This is above me where I was that morning. And you can see beautiful blue skies, which is what we are um, often um, entertained with here at the beautiful American Northwest. So a subtitle of this talk about MELAS disease, and I'm going to tell you what that acronym means momentarily, is AMP kinase dysfunction. Now, I know that some of you have seen some of my previous talks because I've gotten feedback on them. AMP kinase is going to be one of those signaling enzyme mechanisms which imparts a control over gene expression. So some signaling molecules work at the level of binding to receptors and then inducing a series of signal transduction cascades, ultimately leading perhaps to kinases which add phosphate covalently to amino acids embedded in proteins, um, but not always. And the AMP kinase is a very unusual molecular switch, as we'll see, because uh, it's a dictum to the cell to alter not just metabolism and gene expression, but to really rewire its entire future interactions with the other cells in the tissue and in fact in the entire body at a homeostatic level. So it's a very important triggering um, button in the middle of uh, control over what's going to happen to a cell's fate uh, once AMP kinase has been induced. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you from a paper uh, uh, from Oncotarget, Oncotarget, that's the name of a journal. Uh, this paper came out very recently, a few months ago. There is the citation, and in fact, you can get this because it's free online. There is the link for the paper uh, that you can pick up directly. Okay, what's the background we need to know for this talk? 50% of mitochondrial DNA mutations are in the 22 transfer RNA genes, okay? The, the, of the, so that so half of all of the disease that we call mitochondrial disease um, happens in just the transfer RNA genes of the mitochondria. Now, transfer RNA, remember, are those small RNA molecules which basically link up amino acid um, biosynthesis and availability with the synthesis of protein. Remember, protein, of course, is composed of a, is a polymer of amino acids. And so the transfer RNA are going to be charged with amino acids. And as we read through the messenger RNA at the ribosome during translation for polypeptide synthesis, those transfer RNAs 
are going to be bound to their cognate specific amino acids. So that each transfer RNA is read as an anticodon. That anticodon then is um, translated into adding an amino acid to the growing polypeptide chain. And that's how you get a sequence within a polypeptide that goes from the amino terminus to the carboxy terminus, which makes all the proteins in the cell. Both prokaryotes and eukaryotes utilize transfer RNA, which are RNA molecules. Okay, so that's one thing. And in fact, this disease we're going to talk about today is, for all intents and purposes, the disease which is imparted by mutation in a very specific interaction of one of the transfer RNA genes, as we'll see. So in particular, there is a, an A to G transition. Both of those are purines, so we call that a transition. At nucleotide 3243, in the transfer RNA leucine, that's the isoaccepting molecule that adds leucine to the growing polypeptide chain. There's a name for that particular mutation and for that particular gene, it's MT-TL1. And it's linked to mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis stroke-like episodes, or known as the acronym MELAS. So encephalomyopathy means that both there's going to be a central nervous system that is brain dysfunction, and myopathy has to do, of course, with muscle. So a brain muscle pathology that's going to be associated with circulating high levels of lactic acid or lactic acidosis, which could be life-threatening, which can be associated or is in this disease directly associated with stroke-like episodes. And so it's a very damaging, deleterious disease. Now, because it's mitochondrial, those of you that have a genetics background or just basically have a general knowledge know that that means it's maternally inherited, okay? So it's a mitochondrial disorder. It's going to be maternally inherited. It can be a gen genetic disorder, okay? So Mila's patients typically have advanced dementia. That's one of their symptomology, advanced dementia not associated with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or classic prefrontal dementia. This is a unique type of dementia. It's a common mitochondrial DNA mutation, this particular one, and it's accounting for 80% of all the reported cases of MILIS. So there are 20-odd percent that don't seem to map to this one single location for mutation. But still, by and large, okay, four-fifths of all of MILIS patients seem to have this one mutation. It's very common. This results in somehow, and this paper is going to discuss this, a deficiency in electron transport chain or ETC complexes one and four. There are a total of five complexes in the inner mitochondrial membrane which connect the oxidation of NADH and FADH2 to the reduction of molecular oxygen to water and the biosynthesis of ATP. That's called electron transport chain oxi oxidative phosphorylation. That's what the mitochondria's main um, uh, popularity is, or understanding in the biochemical terms of popularity, or best understood, because that's how you make ATP. Okay. So <clears throat> that is found in this mutation. Okay, so basically the mutation results in a deficiency in ATP synthesis. Now, remember, it's going to be linked to a transfer RNA, a very specific one, tRNA leucine. Okay, so how does that make it so that you get a deficiency in ATP synthesis? Well, right away, I want you to understand that some of the genes that are in the electron transport chain are expressed from mitochondrial DNA. And because they're expressed from mitochondrial DNA, you have to be able to take the DNA from mitochondria, transcribe it to RNA, and translate it to polypeptide. And those polypeptides are going to be, some of them are going to be the complexes in the electron transport chain. You see how that works. A mutation in the transfer RNA can result in a mutation in the proteins that are synthesized with the mitochondrial DNA. And this, this, those proteins are... Um, intimately associated with ATP synthesis, you get a deficiency in ATP synthesis. Okay. All right. So from the very specific mutation to a more general phenotype. Okay. Very common in disease. 
So the insufficiency of ATP production correlates with Milas etiology and presentation. Okay, so they're all well described and well linked. Now, let's back off from the paper for a moment and let's take a look at a really important website that I use all the time. It's called the Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man website, or OMIM. And there is the entry we're going to talk about today. There's the link for it. But you can Google OMIM and you can get into that website. It's totally free. And you can look up any gene, particularly those that are important in, uh, in man. Okay, So you, get, you won't be looking at rat or mouse or plant genes. You'll be looking just at those genes or, or any other primate, only be looking at Homo sapiens genes. So it's a very nice website for that. And here's the entry I want. I look went to to get more detail on the mutation we're going to be looking at for this talk. So mitochondrial genomic transcription requires, of course, uh, lots of things in order to function. One of the things is a binding of a termination factor. Now let me back up here a moment. When you transcribe RNA from DNA, you make a you make a, messenger RNA, you make ribosomal RNA, and you, in fact, make transfer RNA. All those molecular species, all those RNA species. <clears throat> now, anytime you make a transcript, you have to initiate the transcript, and there are factors involved in that. You have to elongate the transcript, that is, you have to continue to add nucleotides to read through the DNA to make it the transcript that's got the right sequence. And then ultimately, you have to end it or terminate it. So the termination is a termination codon. And that termination codon tells the machinery that's carrying out transcription to stop. And then you get what's called the nascent, mature, or at least the preform of the mature RNA. Okay, you've now terminated that RNA. That transcript is ready for processing. All this is happening in the nucleus in, in man, in, in eukaryotes in general. And then the rest of the processing of that messenger RNA has to do with capping, sometimes splicing, uh, certainly association of all the exons together, splicing out all the introns, transport out of the nucleus, movement to the nucleus, movement from the nucleus to the cytoplasmin, cytoplasm, excuse me, and either being translated in cytoplasmic polyribosome structures, which involve ribosomal RNA, or to places like the endoplasmic reticulum, where other genes are also translated, okay? All right. So that's a very brief discussion of central dogma transcription translation, but I want you to understand you need termination of an RNA. So there's a factor called mTERF. TR means termination, right? Termination factor. M is for mitochondria. As I mentioned in previous talks, the geneticists um, sometimes make uh, really gross, silly uh, acronyms and names, but every once in a while they get it right, and here the geneticist, I think, made a pretty good term here. At least that's, I'm going to accuse the geneticist for coming up with this. I might find out later it's a good biochemist that did it. So you never know. So this binding of this termination factor, mTERF, is to a 13 base pair termination sequence. And those nucleotides are specifically in, in the end of the RNA, nucleotides 3237 to 3249, okay? And those are located, like the ones we're talking about here, are located within the transfer RNA leucine gene. Okay, now what you need to make that leucine residue is UUR. Okay, so that's what's going to code for the codon for leucine. Okay, because you have a triplet codon for each amino acid. And that's at the RNA levels. That's why you see uracil there, right? Okay, so mTERF1 binding to the termination sequence unwinds the DNA. So this is a molecular biophysical event. It unwinds the DNA and promotes the eversion or flipping of those three nucleotides. And that nucleotide flipping results in transcriptional termination. So it's absolutely necessary. It has to have high fidelity for this to work. If it doesn't work, you don't get proper termination. So the uridine, the, U, the, U, the uridine in the wobble position of the anticodon of MTTL1 is modified. So there's a very specific alteration of that to taurinomethyluridine, okay? So MTTL1 containing that mutation 
causes the Milas syndrome. So that gives you a little bit of the biophysical background. Again, I got that directly for a moment. So the mistranslation of leucine to phenylalanine as caused by that mutant transfer RNA decreases the rate of mitochondrial protein synthesis. Now, it's just that simple. Of course, that doesn't seem simple to many people, but that's really what we're talking about. You're getting now a depression in all mitochondrial protein synthesis. So why is it only going to affect complexes one and four in the electron transport chain? Because those are very abundant proteins. So if you're going to depress the expression of proteins made from mitochondrial DNA, those that are most abundantly expressed are going to be the ones most affected. So there's a certain critical point or critical mass of that protein in the inner mitochondrial membrane, after which those proteins stop functioning at their high fidelity, high activity level. And apparently this mutation in this transfer RNA leucine and the association with that mTERF at the unwinding, which causes termination of that particular nascent RNA is the result of that. Okay. It's the cause and the result, of course, is poor translation. So in a molecular process that involves alterations in gene expression, the mitochondrial mutation induces the expression of energy generating pathways that involves both mitochondrial and nuclear chromatin remodeling. So ultimately, the mitochondrial genome and the expression there uh, from is going to also have an effect on the nuclear genome and the expression of the genes there. That's because the gene expression in the mitochondria is highly coupled, conversant, communicating with the uh, gene expression from the nucleus so that you have a coordinated effort to make polypeptides that will be mitochondrially synthesized, nuclear synthesized, and then coherently expressed and embedded within the mitochondria so they function to make the mitochondria fully um, able to carry out its business. So that's something to keep in mind. Whenever you alter mitochondrial DNA um, by causing a mutation and therefore induce a mutation that results in a translational defect, that ultimately is going to signal back to the nucleus. Now, one other thing to keep in mind, and this is like this is like high level understanding, but once you understand it, you won't forget it, hopefully, is that the eukaryotic cell has more than one mitochondria per cell. So they got one nucleus, at least most of them do, except that maybe if they're cancer cells, but they can have many mitochondria. So that means that you can have a heterologous mixture of mitochondria, which may or may not have a mutation. Okay. So that means that sometimes these mutations are silent and sometimes they are corrected. So not every mitochondria is going to be singing the same tune, the mutant tune, the mutant mis, uh, uh, misguided chorus. Right? So some of the mitochondria may not have the mutation, even though they're all coming maternally, because not all the maternal mitochondria may have had the mutation, you see. So because of that, you're going to have differential expression of the mutation, and you're going to have varying degrees of uh, dysfunction in many less patients. Okay. Right. So anyway, let's get back to this. Increase in oxidative phosphorylation associated messenger RNA from both mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA compensate, see, for the incidence of that mutation in skeletal muscle. So that's the reason you have a variation in the disease. That is why the penetrance of the disease isn't complete. Okay? And not all Milas patients uh, present the same way. Some of them have really uh, very uh, um, high rates of dementia, very poor muscle contractility because of the fact that the Milas mutation is um, it penetrated deeply, which means you have a lot of mitochondria that have this mutation. And you can go to the other side of the spectrum where you have less mutation and there's less need for compensation and you have a phenotype which is much more like a healthy person. Okay. okay. So molecular manipulation of that mutation in heteroplasmic cybrid cell maps onto plasma membrane activity and epigenomic rewriting that knocks on energy metabolism, signal transduction cascades, senescence, and telomere length. 
So this one mutation has a global effect on the cell. Just because we are uh, focusing in, we're laser studying those complexes in the electron transport chain for this paper, remember that this mutation has a global effect on those mutant cells and tissues and therefore the organism, the human being, that is unfortunate to have these mutations. Now, um, a little definition here about heteroplasmic cybrids. Primary cultures, so in this study, primary cultures of skin fibroblasts from MELAS patients, okay, were used. And you'll see data where you're going to see M1 through 4. Those are MELAS patients' mitochondria from them, okay? And in whom their mitochondrial DNA have that mutation in that gene, okay? So that's going to be them. The, they're going to be compared in this study with three healthy volunteers um, who do not have that mutation. So you're going to be looking at fibroblast cell, fibro, uh, the cell called the fibroblast, and you're going to be looking at gene expression, and you're going to be looking at um, bioenergetic parameters in the fibroblast. Okay, so this is what, but it comes from humans. So it's not a it's not a human study dealing with uh, uh, all cell types or tissue types, only with those fibroblasts that have been cultured from either mellus or non mellus uh, patients. Okay, so I want you to understand how this work is done. And it's called heteroplasmic because the, the uh, mitochondria is, as I said, resident in more than one copy per cell. So you're going to have a heteroplasmic milieu. Some of the mitochondria are going to have the mutation, some are not. That's why you get variation when you look at individual MELAS patients, and you're going to see that in the data. Now, remember that variation is also linked to the pleiotropic effect on the nuclear DNA expression. So that's why you're going to imagine a great deal of complexity in the actual biochemical phenotype of these people. And we're not looking at all of that. We're only looking at a very discrete set of genes, as we'll see. So what they're going to demonstrate in this research paper is the following. They are going to observe both dysfunctional oxidative phosphorylation and fatty acid oxidation. Oxfos is the way you make ATP, which I've already described to you. Fatty acid oxidation is taking fatty acids, preformed long-chain aliphatic monocarboxylic acids, oxidizing them, ultimately making NADH and FADH2, which should enter the electron transport chain to make ATP. So there's going to be dysfunction at both levels, okay? Now, the overriding malfunction that they're going to demonstrate is going to be linked to what's called metabolic inflexibility. That means the inability to adjust metabolism, which we said before is what compensates in people that don't show the phenotype of MELAS, or at least doesn't penetrate deeply, resulting in severe dementia and severe muscle con contractility issues. Now, energy deficits not compensated in, uh, because of this metabolic inflexibility are going to be linked to the AMP kinase signaling, which we're going to see loses fidelity. So I want you to understand that you always have to consider that between gene expression and ultimate functioning of proteins, such as complexes and electron transport chain, you're going to have signaling phenomena that are going to be, um, induced and deployed when trying to compensate for alterations in energy metabolism, as you might guess. So what kind of energy metabolism? Switching biofuels. Two main biofuels we're going to discuss here are carbohydrate, glucose, that is, specifically, and fatty acids. You see how that, in, that introduces and involves talking about intermediary metabolism and the utilization of carbon sources such as glucose and fatty acid to generate ATP. Okay. So you'll see how this fits together. Now AMP kinase, more about it. It's an enzyme that perpetuates the signaling of biofuel, in this case only carbohydrate and fatty acid we're going to talk about, but remember that amino acids can also be used for biofuel, and stress homeostasis. Okay, so there's going to be a stress on the cell and the amp kinase can be generated, uh, activated. And when that happens, there's a whole different pair. There's a tremendous paradigm shift in the cell. Okay, that's the point here. Amp kinase is that molecular switch. 
and it happens to be an enzyme. Now, it performs that biochemical work, which is what it is, by sensing the depletion of ATP. So it's basically very simple. If ATP gets, gets depleted, that means two things. That means it's getting used. ATP is being hydrolyzed, the ADP and PI. And what else? You're not making more of it. So to deplete the cellular stores of ATP, two things have to happen. You have to use ATP and you have to use it beyond what can be replenished. Okay, so two things there that we're going to focus in on, corner on these meless patients. So more about AMP kinase. Not only does it recognize the depletion of ATP, it is a multi-domain, multi-peptide subunit enzyme complex, which means it has multiple polypeptide subunits. And that is what you find in complex proteins that receive signals and transduce them. So they receive molecular information, the AMP kinase subunits do, through covalent modification and allosteric ligand binding. Okay? So there's a whole lot of control over this enzyme. One of the ways it's controlled is via phosphorylation itself. That is, it gets phosphorylated, even though it is a kinase that does that job at the tail end. But it also, as we'll see, is going to be controlled by acetylation. Acetylation also going to control the um, bioactivity of the AMP kinase. Okay. And so there's just a couple of things. There's more than that, but those two are what we're going to see in the data. Now, get back to the detail of AMP kinase. The binding of ADP plus or minus AMP to the gamma subunit of this protein promotes the necessary phosphorylation and inhibitory dephosphorylation of a particular amino acid residue in the AMP kinase. That's threonine 172. Okay. So that amino acid is going to have hovering over it a regulation of how much phosphate is on that OH group on threonine. That means it's going to be promoting phosphorylation and inhibiting the dephosphorylation, so that all is going to be regulated by the binding of the ligand to the enzyme complex. And it's going to be both ADP and AMP that's going to be that ligand that's going to regulate that phosphostate of the enzyme itself. Okay. And that's what you need to have uh, full activity of the AMP kinase. You have to have that threonine phosphorylated fully. Now, AMP binding accelerates allosteric activation of the phosphorylated kinase. So on top of everything else, the AMP binding at another site, not the site where this, this phosphorylation occurs, that's what's called allosteric, other solid in Greek, okay? It's going to give you the full blown, okay? All wheels on the ground, fully active AMP kinase, okay? And it's going to maintain that phosphorylated state. Two major upstream kinases responsible for AMP kinase activation are known. They are the tumor suppressor LKB1, which I've talked about in previous talks and in some of my oncogenic discussions, and another protein called calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase kinase. So it's a protein kinase kinase, not because I made a mistake and put those two words together and I shouldn't have been. It's because it's a kinase that phosphorylates a kinase, okay? An enzyme that adds a phosphate to another enzyme which in itself adds phosphates. Okay, so it's a kinase kinase. And there's one other um, a, a protein responsible for controlling the phosphorylation state of AMP kinase, and it's called TAC1, and it's known as transforming growth factor beta-activated kinase 1 of TAC1. There's three different kinases involved. Yeah, it's complicated, but yeah, that's how bio biology works. Okay. So besides... AMP, ADP, and calcium itself, because calcium's got to activate that calmodulin KK. Reactive oxygen also activates AMP kinase. This is where the stress phenomena comes in. You get a lot of reactive oxygen generated, you're going to turn on the AMP kinase, okay? Which is going to totally remarshal what the cell does, as we'll see in a moment. Okay. The AMP kinase is really an important molecular switch, almost like a almost like a, a light switch coming on and off and from complete darkness to complete light. So here it is, AMP kinase switches off anabolic pathways, that is biosynthesis of proteins, for example, while turning on catabolic path pathways. That means breaking down things like biofuels. And it does it to restore energy homeostasis, to get the ATP back up. Remember, AMP kinase is called that because it binds to AMP. 
and you make AMP, adenosine, adenosine monophosphate, because you hydrolyzed ATP to ADP and then ADP to AMP. Each time removing a phosphate, each time getting energy, right? So AMP kinase is going to be a perfect way to control that whole regulation because it's sensing the amount of AMP. Now, I'm not going to get back into talking about energy charge. I did that in at least two or three other talks I've given recently. But energy charge is a factor in this. So if you know what I'm talking about, fine. If you don't, you don't need to know it really here today. Anyways, the AMP kinase controls pathways involved in metabolism, cell growth, and survival. So let's take a look at this. AMP kinase, okay, when it's phosphorylated, the red lines mean that it's active. The blue line is, is where inhibition occurs, okay? So AMP kinase is going to inhibit something called mTORC. And when you inhibit that, you're not going to get protein synthesis. AMP kinase is going to inhibit TBC1D1. And when you inhibit that, you're not going to get, it's not going to be allowed to block GLUT4. Now, that's, I know it's hard to understand, but the way these diagrams work, you have to understand how to read them. Normally, AMP kinase is going to block this. That's good. When it blocks that, that can't function to block this, you see. That means glucose uptake via GLUT4 is going to be up, regulated when AMP kinase is phosphorylated. Let's take a look at a positive effect. AMP kinase is going to turn on some factor, and when it does so, it's going to increase fatty acid uptake through CD36. I talked about this recently in a few other lectures. Go back and take a look at those if you want to know a lot about CD36. Okay. Again, uh, a negative pathway. I am kinase is going to control acetyl-CoA carboxylase. When it, can, when it phosphorylates that, what's it going to do? It's going to, first of all, shut down fatty acid synthesis, but also because this isn't available to make malonyl-CoA, you're not going to block fatty acid oxidation. Okay, so that means that fatty acid oxidation will proceed. Okay, will proceed. That's what that means. Okay, here's another po uh, negative positive. Okay, blocking the other, there's two forms of acetylcarboxylase. When you block it, you're not going to get fatty acid synthesis. So there's two forms of the carboxylase. One controls fatty acid oxidation, the other controls synthesis of fatty acids. It's a beautiful switch there, too, by the way. Um, okay, this is the whole steroid pathway, uh, cholesterol pathway. It's going to block that. And because of that, you're not going to get cholesterologenesis. You see, it's also through the hmg coy reductase uh, gene. So you're not going to get cholesterol synthesis, you're not going to get complex lipid synthesis, and you're not going to get any fatty acid synthesis when amp kinase is up. Remember, you're shutting down anabolism. Okay, You're turning on things like P21 and P53, which is going to actually result in cell cycle arrest and can ultimately cause programmed cell death. So these cells are under stress. If there's so much stress and they get a lot of co-signaling, those cells are going to commit suicide. Okay, they're going to apoptose. Um, likewise, though, before you ever get to just killing yourself, these cells are going to start consuming themselves, a process called autophagy. Now, that just means taking all the macromolecules in the cell and digesting them to make energy, but also to stop all the players, all the proteins that are out there from doing what they normally were doing, not only stop their synthesis and bioactivity, but also do what? Consume the very proteins, the very catalysts, right? So autophagy is just an amazing thing in cells because it basically says, not only you stop what you're doing, I'm going to eliminate the tools you had to do what you were doing, okay? That's what autophagy is. And kill the cell, though. It's different than apoptosis. So you need more signaling down there. Histone H2B is also going to be turned on by AMP kinase, and that's actually going to promote survival. In fact, autophagy is a form of survival. It doesn't kill the cell. It just tells the cell to completely stop what it's doing, consume parts of itself, coordinate parts of it, so you get energy. You clear the deck of all of the bioactive players so you can go to the next phase, next step. And that's going to involve more signaling. Because that's the idea about how absolutely brilliant AMP kinase is, okay? So you're going to get energy homeostasis maintenance, okay? And that's the whole point, okay? You're also going to get growth and survival. So there's two different components or like a yin and yang of AMP kinase, right? You're going to get energy homeostasis. At the same time, you're going to get growth and survival control, okay? One of the other things it's going to do is it's going to promote a glucose uptake. So there's your biofuel. You're going to get fatty acid oxidation. 
You're going to get glucose uptakes. You're going to be able to burn glucose. You're going to be able to burn fatty acid. You're going to be able to take up fatty acids. Okay. So this, uh, for example, for muscle cells, it can do that th th this very, very effectively, right? Again, energy, energy, energy. We need to make ATP, AMP kinase to turn on for that. But we also have the slow growth. We don't want any cell division going on. And we don't want any necessary, unnecessary nation's protein synthesis. So we're knocking out the torque pathway. Okay? So it's, it's, again, in terms of like understanding a numerian metabolism, if you understand the AMP kinase and that really significant molecular switch, you understand half of all the processes. The other half is the anabolic one, okay? When everything is tuned up. Here we're not destroying necessarily, although we, we're poised where we could, you see. We're more interested really in getting these cell lineages in line to know a stress is going on, start making more ATP, and preparing for the worst. And the worst could be apoptosis program cell so death. Anyways, this beautiful diagram uh, came from a paper in Molecular Cancer Research 2015. So that's where I borrowed it from. All right. Now here's data from our paper from the UNC target. This is a Western blot. The air, these are subunits one, two, three, four, and five from the electron transport chain. You might say, well, what are those? Well, I am going to show you. This is the inner mitochondrial membrane here. See, it says inner membrane. This is the intermembrane space that is the aqueous compartment between the inner and the outer membrane of the mitochondria. That's right, the mitochondria member has two membranes. Inner membrane of the mitochondria does all the like fancy electron transport. The outer, outer membrane ba ba acts basically like a molecular sieve. Okay, controlling protein import, export, ion movement, and whatnot. But it does, it's not, it's not completely permeable. It doesn't allow these protons, for example, to just diffuse away. Anyways, electron transport chain basically just involves these complexes moving electrons, that's what's called electron transport, through various protein complexes in the membrane, one, two, three, and four. In the way, in that process, those electrons are going to ultimately reduce molecular oxygen to water. That's why it's called oxidative phosphorylation. The phosphorylation part is protons that have been kicked out of this uh, matrix within the mitochondria because of the um, oxidation of NADH and FADH2, which were synthesized either from fatty acid oxidation or the TCA cycle by burning pyruvate to, from acetyl-CoA and OAA in the TCA cycle, reoxidizing those sending out protons into the inner mitochondrial space, pumping those back in through the complex five, so-called complex five, which is a proton pumping ATP, it's generating ATP. So the electron transport chain drives electrons, ultimately to turn oxygen into water. The ultimate re reduced oxygen in on the planet is water. That's how you take oxygen all the way to its final reduced form. You can also make hydrogen peroxide, but that's not what's happening here. That's a peroxisomal event, by the way. But again, just remember ATP. So complex one in MELAS patients, remember these are fibroblasts and MELAS patients with those, you know, heterologous, right? You have some of those mitochondria mutations, some don't. That's why you have, look at the alteration here. This is fold of control. There's your control of complex one. That means higher levels means more complex one, more of that protein. You have M13, M4, all statistically much lower. Look at M3. Wow really tanked levels of complex one. Now look at complex two. Not the same effect. Your MELAS patients have about the same amount of complex two, that's this protein right here, than does the control. In fact, some of them have a little bit more. What about complex three? Ditto. No real effect. So there's complex three right there. Really important complex uh, for, for moving electrons from the quinone pool to the cytochrome C pool ultimately going to the cytochrome C oxidase in, in complex four. Really important intermediary complex in the electron transport chain. Guess what? Not affected by these in these MELAS patients. But complex four, very important. That's the terminal oxidase depressed in the MELAS patients as compared to control. So it's taking your Western blots, right, and scanning using densitometry to look at how much actual protein is in this gel, right, looking at how much is actually there via densitometry. Um, and plotting that on these histograms. That's basically all these are histograms from this data. 
and you see very low levels, see very low levels, boom, 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 boom of complex four. So you don't have good electron transport. If you don't have good electron transport, you're not going to make a lot of ATP because that's like the end product. See, how about complex five, the proton pumping ATPs? Hey, doesn't seem to have any effect in these patients. About the same, maybe a little bit above the control, but it's nothing statistical. So complex one, complex four. As I said a few slides back, while they're demonstrating this paper, in the MILAS patients they looked at, there are two proteins, mitochondrial encoded, they're going to be um, uh, diminished in their expression because of that mutation in that transfer RNA leucine. That's going to be complexes one and four in the electron transport chain. That's going to ultimately cause ATP depletion, which is going to turn on AMP kinase, you see? Yeah. Now, MILAS cells show impairment of OXFOS, okay, consistent with the uh, deficiency in the electron transport chain. So take a look. Here's basal respiration. That's just consumption of oxygen, depressed in the MELAS patients. Some variation, and that's because not all the mitochondria and not all that complex interaction between nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA and the expression of the genes in those two genomes. That's why you get this heterologous. It's not an even line with all the patients. Basal respiration lowered. ATP link respiration, that's OXFAS lowered. Maximal respiration, okay, when you really look at how much total oxygen can be consumed, depressed, depressed in the MELAS patients. Reserve capacity, that means when you pump in fatty acids, you say, well, once you've depleted all the fuel, how well is it taking exogenous? What, what's the reserve capacity mm -hmm. here? It's not good, okay, it's not good. Likewise, there was an associated genetic background. That's why you get that, that's, okay, I wrote here. There's an association of the nuclear background in these mitochondrial uh, mutations. That's what we're showing you here. Variable according to MILAS fibroblast cell line. This is a mitochondrial by nuclear question mark because it's presumably what's going on. Hetero interaction, okay? It's the way I look at it. The reason I put the question mark there is that, you know, it could be something to do that's not necessarily DNA expression, DNA to RNA to protein expression, nucleus versus mitochondria. Maybe the products themselves or something happening at the membranes is more complicated than that. Now, I want you to pay close attention. Uh, glycolysis doesn't seem to be affected. Glycolytic capacity doesn't seem to be affected. That is the oxidation of glucose. Basal respiration, as we've said, is depressed in the MELAS patients, okay? And look at where it seems to be coming from. Fatty acid oxidation, underutilization of fatty acid oxidation in the MELAS patients. You're not able to oxidize fatty acids. And what else? You're not able to completely oxidize glucose. Now, the way the gl glucose is oxidized, ultimately, you go through glycolysis, seven steps. You ultimately make pyruvic acid. Pyruvate dehydrogenase and enzyme that makes acetyl-CoA. The acetyl-CoA is going to enter the TCA cycle. And then you're going to have the complete oxidation of the acetate to carbon dioxide. You're going to make NADH and FADH2. You also made some NADH from the pyruvate dehydrogenase making the acetyl coa because decarboxylase is going to make some reducing equivalents. So, wow, that's what that means. Just like what the phenotype says is supposed to see, you don't get complete glucose oxidation, you don't get fatty acid oxidation, okay, in your MELAS patients as compared to your control. Remember the white bar, the C is the control, the black bar is M1 through M4, those are all of the MELAS patients. The fibroblasts from them, you remember with the heterologous mitochondrial content. That's why they're not a lever. Now, they're going to be looking at a lot of different transcription factors. Take a look at PGC1 alpha. Now, we're going to get back to this at the end. I just want you to notice there's a lot of variation around that, but there are some patients, perhaps the ones showing the most severe dementia, for example, that have highly depressed activity of PGC1 alpha. And others seem to have higher levels, okay, higher levels of control. So there's a lot of variation in transcription factor there. Now this is working down, this is working in tandem with AMP kinase. Okay. So now we're looking at the signaling of AMP kinase. And I'll show you a, a diagram in a minute how that works. So I want you to remember that PGC1 alpha transcription factor, it looks like it, with most of the MELAS patients, look, it's elevated. And there's some, certainly it looks like there is some uh, statistical significance between them and the control. Although M1, no difference. So see, there's a lot of variation in that. So once you start moving away from one of the primary signaling phenomena, you start noticing that there's a lot of variation in the total expression of those transcription factors, which are going to ultimately control gene expression. <clears throat> now, 
NRF1, NRF2, these are really important factors for mitochondrial gene expression. Don't seem to have any effect. TFAM, same thing, although there looks like there might be some uh, significance here. Okay, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about that. They didn't, and that's not really important to, for us here. Now, what is important is the phosphorylated AMP kinase is upregulated in all of our MELAS patients. So we already know that should happen because we know that the signaling is going to be leading to AMP kinase induction because you're getting a depletion of ATP. And indeed, the phospho AMP divided by the total AMP is in elevated. Phospho AMP remember, is the active one. Now, so let's take a look at this. Let's go back here now. Let's look at CERT3. Now, CERT3 is a deacetylase, okay? So notice that CERT3, what it does, according to this paper that I pulled out, reduces lipid accumulation via AMP kinase activation. So when CERT3 goes up, AMP kinase is elevated. That's the important point here. So these two slides should be considered when you see the increase. Just imagine that that means that AMP kinase activity is up because of both of those phenomena, phosphorylation and the CERT3. CERT3 is deacetylase. So when you deacetylate AMP kinase, it's activated. That's what that means. And a paper I pulled out of the literature from 2010 shows that that ultimately leads to a reduction in lipid accumulation. Now, that makes sense because remember, AMP kinase shuts off the acid synthesis. See? So there's another part of the signaling. I know it's a lot of stuff, but I wanted to go through the data. I haven't gone through a lot of the data. In the last couple of talks, I wanted to show you that we can really dissect these papers for those of you that want to do this. And I know there is a large population of you that do. Now, remember, okay, now let's go down here to look at uh, PACC. Remember, that's the, that's the carboxylase. When you phosphorylate the acetyl CoA carboxylase, you inhibit fatty acid synthesis, so you're going to get less of it. You make less fuel, remember? You make less fuel, and you're also going to make less ATP, even though you have elevated AMP kinase. Why are you going to make less ATP? Because even though you got all these other ducks in a row, complex one and complex four are deficient in your realized patients. They're not going to be able to take that electron reduce molecular oxygen to water, pump those electrons ultimately so that you get the movement of protons, funneling down, siphoning down into the proton pumping ATP has to make ATP. Yeah, okay. So part of the signaling is good, part of it's corrupted. That's what we're seeing here in the MELAS patients. So the reduced CPT1, okay, means less fatty acid transport to the mitochondria. Now CPT1, carnitine palmitoyl transferase, I've talked about in several other talks, that's the protein that gets acyl-CoAs into the mitochondria where beta oxidation occurs. So if you don't have a good CPT1 expression, you don't get good transport of fatty acids from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria where beta oxidation occurs. So that becomes a useless, useless fuel because you can't get the fuel in the mitochondria, you're not going to be able to make ATP. So, so, a, so you, get a, you get a reduction in CPT1. That's not good, even though AMP kinase should be making all this stuff up, up, up. There's a corruption in the signaling. Again, mapping to that mutation in that transfer hour in the isoaccepting leucine. What else? PDH. PD, Phospho-PDH means less pyruvate to the TCA cycle. Okay, So phospho-PDH, okay, notice that it's going to have that the levels of it are going to be a little bit uh, reduced compared to the control, okay? So when you have when you have this ratio reduced compared to the control, it might mean that you have a little bit more pyruvate dehydrogenase active. So when you have the phospho, it means less pyruvate, but this is depressed in the MELAS patients, although I'm, a, I'm not really impressed with it. Like M4, there's no effect. There is a little bit of statistical difference here between M1, M2, M3, and then the total M population compared to control. Still, it doesn't really make me really excited. But it does mean there's a molecular switch there controlling part of that whole pathway, sending the pyruvate derived from glucose into the mitochondria's acetyl-CoA. That's what that particular patterning means. All right. Almost done here. This is the last of the data, okay? So this is ATP levels, okay? Actual amount. You can see that there's less ATP in all of our MELAS patients. You can, when you see when you add a glucose or glycolysis inhibitor, you're going to get less glycolysis overall and throughout all of the MELAS patients. But the big hit here is when you block beta oxidation. Holy smokes, that's when you really see the impact on the amount of ATP. So that means that 
in the MELAS patients, they were trying to make that switch. Remember, we were going to call this inflexibility, metabolic inflexibility. The flex is, hey, we can't do much with glucose because our electron transport chain is getting deficient, even though you recall that fatty acid oxidation is also going to need that same complex. The, the TCA cycle complex is more linked not just to the NADH and FADH2 levels, but also linked to the movement of carbon, you see? So glycolysis is not going to be as effective as beta oxidation because you want to have the flexibility to switch to beta oxidation because it because if you have the problem with gly glycolytic pathway and because that's more intimately linked to the actual TCA, that is the tricarboxylic acid intermediates in the TCA cycle that are intimately involved in ADH production, whereas in fatty acid oxidation, you don't need any of those intermediates. You just burn ADH, right? You bypass the TCA cycle, basically. So this inflexibility is really shown in this last data slide. So here's a summary of their work. You get reduced oxidative phosphorylation because that mutation fails to activate an adaptive switch of energy metabolism fatty acid oxidation. Let's take a look. So AMP kinase is supposed to turn on PGC1-alpha. That is supposed to turn on CERT3. CERT3 deacetylates, okay? Deacetylation of PDH is supposed to turn that on. Remember, it also is going to help control AMP kinase itself, not shown here. It's going to block, AMP kinase is going to block acetylcholine oxygen, not going to get fatty acid synthesis. So everything looks like it should work out okay. However, it doesn't, okay? Because CPT levels are also depressed in our MELAS patients, right? Also, there's a depression in complex one and complex four. So even though you're getting some glucose moving through because you've activated the pyruvate dehydrogenase somewhat because of this CERT pathway, you've activated AMP kinase also through the CERT mediation. But the problem, is, and, and remember that beta oxidation is also not working too well because you've depre de depressed the amount of what? fatty acid, acyl carnitine is going to get into the mitochondria. So you're going to decrease that anyway. So you should be making a boatload of NADH. You are making some in these MELAS patients. But guess what? Because the electron transport chain isn't working correctly, you're just not going to make enough ATP. So ultimately, the ATP level decreases. It continues to tell the AMP kinase pathway, hey, we need more ATP. Please shut down anabolism, be ter please turn on glycolysis, TCA, beta oxidation, but there's a corruption in some of the genes that can facilitate the movement of that carbon, like CPT1, and because of that, you're not going to be able to do that molecular switch, you're inflexible, beta oxidation is going to tank, because of that, you're going to decrease the amount of um, NADH moving through the whole system, you're not going to be able to recycle that, that because you're not going to make enough NAD, and you need the NAD to help to drive beta oxidation, you see? So you oxidize the NADH, you make NAD. That NAD should be the substrate for fatty acid oxidation. It's not there because you're not able to utilize it. The complex one is not going to make it for you. It's depressed, you see? That's what that means. So functional reduction of fatty acid oxidation because there's not enough NAD around. And you get dependence on glycolysis to restore energy deficiency, but it's not going to be enough, okay? The dysfunctional cellular adaptation is modulated through signaling network of AMP kinase, BGC1 alpha. Remember that was altered a little bit in those MELAS patients. They were trying to get things to work, right? The cells are trying to move in that direction by modulating CERT3. Remember, it's a transcription factor there. Um, but that fails to uprightly regulate the mitochondrial gene expression. So you are not getting, along with all this interesting superimposition of bioenergetic control because of AMP kicking on AMP kinase, which is not affected by that mutation. That is all working solvently. What's not working correctly is the expression of complexes one and four, that shuts everything down, turns everything to go in the wrong direction. You can't be flexible. You can't utilize your fatty acids. And bing and a bing, you get this terrible MELAS disorder. And depending on the level of inflexibility, you get a severe dementia, severe problem with muscle contractility, and you get a severe MELAS phenotype. See, that's an interesting explanation of this very complex pathway. All right, this comes from Another paper, uh, this is Advances in Physiology. I think it's a 2006 paper, actually, but there's a link you can get directly. Uh, physiology gives you everything open access, so you can get this paper by just tapping on that link. Now, take a look at this. This is what I found out. 
because this looked familiar to me. An underlying biochemical sequelae, that means what follows afterwards, links Milas to diabetes. So what happens in diabetes, okay, is you get a decreased expression of this transcription factor as caused by obesity, nutrient excess, inactivity. Maybe there's some sequence polymorphisms. That means you might get some SNPs or mutations, okay? Glucose fails to turn this whole pathway on. We don't know what it's doing, other transcription factors. You get a decreased transcription of metabolic and mitochondrial genes. You get decreased OXFAS. Doesn't that look like MILAS? Yeah. You get decreased lipid oxidation, fatty acid oxidation. Was that like MILAS? Yeah. You get the decreased accumulation of lipid in the skeletal muscle. We didn't talk about that, but that's the uptake via CD36. And you get in that, that causes insulin resistance, which is associated with obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the reason I'm bringing this up, I know that's like, wow, he just threw like a curveball at us, right? Is to show you how at a biochemical level, okay, that you would think that's like way down in the nitty gritty, right? Where the tire hits the road. It does, but it also is amplified. It blows up all the way to understanding all the physiology. And, you know, I don't know when that dawned on me because I started out being a physiologist. And I still probably hurt am a physiologist. I'm about, that's why I'm a physiological biochemist. But what I really get out of this is that when you alter something at the molecular level, and especially if it's affecting something like fuel utilization, like fatty acids, you corrupt the whole system. And no matter if it's caused by, say, gaining a lot of weight, and then altering fuel utilization because of endocrine hormone alterations like insulin resistance, or if you get it from a mutation in the mitochondria and a transfer RNA iso accepting leucine gene, okay, that it alters termination signals in mitochondrial genome, you end up with phenotypes which look very similar. So I bring this up because I think that what the pharmaceutical companies, if they're not already well aware of this, should be looking at is how a lot of diseases, which seem quite disparate. Here I'm showing you obesity and a genetic disorder, MILAS, but we can also be looking at cancer, have within their confines embedded all the way down at the bedrock of biochemistry, very fundamental alterations to signal transduction utilization of biofuels. So that's the end of my talk. Hopefully that was a lot quicker than usual. Um, this is one of my pictures, of course. This is my chainsaw, who I uh, fondly call Tangerine. Um, if you know Led Zeppelin, you know the song Tangerine. That's why I probably call my chainsaw that. Anyways, this is my chainsaw. I've had it since my daughter Lucinda was born back in 1988. And this is 2017. So here's a real thumbs up for steel chainsaws. That's the same chainsaw. Go through a couple of rebuilds, but still it's the same chainsaw. It's a tree I dropped a while back in the Clearwater St. Joe National Forest. Okay, so enough about this about this picture. Here's my email address um, for VeraMed, info at veramed.com. Send me an email there. Remember, my personal one is djgphd at gmail.com. Anything you want to talk about, send me an email. We can set up an appointment. Remember what VeraMed is, scientists verifying published evidence in medical biosciences. So I want to thanks, thank you very much for paying attention to this talk. Hopefully it was fun to uh, move through it, and hopefully it was a lot quicker than I normally go through it. And, um, yeah, so I guess we ran 58 minutes, which is amazing to me. I thought it was only half an hour, but I bid you uh, adieu, and uh, we will see you soon. So have a really pleasant week. Thank you for your attention. Bye for now.